put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Path of the Titans in 3D movie view. It's been some years since the events of the first film and Io has died off screen. She did leave Perseus with a son named Helios, I guess in order to try to justify her character's addition to the first film, which was you know, otherwise entirely redundant. It wasn't a successful attempt. So anyway, Helios aids in making Perseus less brooding. And I just want to say, thank Zeus for that. And there is, of course, thus some emotional stakes for, you know, Perseus. And in a very early scene, we have Perseus have a bit of a premonition about, you know, events to occur later in the film that show him that he and Helios, you know, might be in danger. So, you know, his... Yeah, something, someone he loves is in great danger, and this is revealed through a vision in a dream. Because that's how you want to start the sequel that people are already slightly unsure if they should be going to watch, you know, rip off Matrix Reloaded, one of the greatest sequel disappointments in the history of sequels. So anyway, one good thing by, about, you know, Io being in the first movie, now that she's gone, because, you know, that's how it goes, it's an action movie, so obviously the love interest of the hero has to be gone by the sequel, now there's room for a romance between Perseus and Andromeda. This is never actually established, but who doesn't see it coming? And yeah, I don't know, they, they, I don't think they figured that they really needed to even bother with it, so they didn't. Anyway, as things were left in the last movie, there is still not a lot of faith in the gods from man or woman, so the gods are losing their power, and this could mean that stuff they did that was good is gonna be undone. So Zeus is worried about, well, he speaks of like demons, I'm not, it's mentioned like once, I'm not sure if what actually gets loose is supposed to be an example of demons, but whatever. So anyway, yeah, because of that, you know, Perseus will have to try to, well, it's, I'm not sure how much of this I should be giving away, but basically, Zeus is in trouble. He's been captured, and he's trapped in Tartarus, so Perseus will have to get into Tartarus, the labyrinth of Tartarus, and get to his, you know, father. Yeah. So, and he is given the what's it called, the uh, trident of Poseidon, and instructed by Poseidon to find his son, the demi demigod Agonos, who I swear is the Geico caveman if he let his beard and his hair grow longer. Seriously. He starts out kind of obnoxious, and then later on he suddenly has no personality at all. I don't know, I guess he didn't want to outshine the rest of the cast, because the only ones with personality are a couple of the gods. And that's actually where the only char interesting character story and, you know, interpersonal relationships and growth 
happen. That's you know, with the gods. It actually, I don't know, some would call it soap opera, some would call it Shakespeare. I place it somewhere in the middle. And it's, it's interesting. It's genuinely interesting. And it's the only interesting thing about the characters. Now, the action is great. It's, you know, the trailers let you know there are going to be several creatures in this. You know, we've got Cyclops. We've got, you know, this two-headed half-wolf thing that breathes fire. Yeah, I don't know. Insert Paris Hilton joke here. Well, the Hilton sisters. Anyway, so, you know, various monsters, and they, you know, they're very nicely designed, you know, very, you know, they, they really seem otherworldly or, you know, not, not, not human, certainly. And there's an adequate and appropriate amount of action with every single one of them. You know, they, there's some build-up and it's established that they're very, very dangerous. And, you know, after that we have, you know, serious fight scenes with them and running from them, hiding from them, you know, trying to defeat them. A lot of the combat in this is, you know, very nicely, you know, except that there are differences of strength, you know. The Cyclops... You don't, you know, just stand your ground and fight that thing. You're going to run and, you know, try to, you know, somehow gain an advantage on it. And that's also something really great. In addition to the creatures, in this, there's, you know, fights with some of the gods. So we've got, you know, several gods fighting each other. We've got gods fighting, you know, not gods. It's really cool, and they very much establish and accept, you know, they very much take the consequence of the fact that there's now something extremely powerful fighting something much less powerful. And, you know, having watched Immortals, this one does a much better job of that. You know, you can really tell that these, you know, there, there's a massive contrast in strength and power here. The 3D, you know, this was one of the things that really worried me. In the first, the first movie is the only movie to date that has given me a headache with 3D. The only one, and you know, that includes movies far longer than the first movie. As you might already know, the, you know, the first movie, it wasn't shot to be 3D, and it, it barely was even 3D. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't really 3D. Near the end of production, they suddenly decided, hey, 3D is making money, you know, Avatar is making money, so let's post-convert. And they do a horrible job of it. This one, it was shot for 3D, and it was converted, I don't know, somewhere early in the process at least. And it really works out. And you can really tell that, you know, they made the right decisions with the 3D, because some stuff is very heavily 3D. And it is truly frickin' epic. And other stuff, very little 3D. So it doesn't get to be, you know, too much. But when it's supposed to be there, you know, the Labyrinth of Tartarus looks amazing. You know, and... Yes, it's in the trailer. There's this magma lava creature that is huge. And some of the stuff with that also in 3D. Again... It looks amazing. Apologies for the cut, I figured you'd like the video better if you could actually see me. Anyway, dialogue, not terribly interesting. I struggle to think of a single memorable line in this. Acting, not terribly impressive. Other than, you know, a couple, the, the gods, again. You know, especially Hades and Zeus, who, again, have some really interesting moments with each other, you know, real... Yeah, there's there's development there, there's stuff that goes on, and, you know, these two were actually given something to do that takes their talent. I'm not sure it completely worked out, but once it, you know, it, some of it felt like it wasn't properly established, and 
such. But once it got going, you know, once they were doing the thing, doing their thing, I, I quite liked it. I quite like what they did with it. The effects are great. It, you know, yeah, everything looks as it should, except maybe for, you know, Pegasus still doesn't quite look so much like a horse as a CGI creation, you know. And yes, Pegasus remains black, you know, affirmative action and all that. The sound is also quite nicely done. It's a very, you know, just there's, there's a presence to the various, you know, the creatures and the areas that they go to, you know. Also, one thing I gotta say about the Labyrinth of Tartarus, it is so, it's, the sequence is so isolated and so claustrophobic. That's really amazing. Once they go there, they don't cut to somewhere else until, you know, yeah, while, while they're in the maze. And it really, you know, there, there are points where you're like wondering, are they ever gonna get through this thing, you know? And at the same time, it doesn't spend excuse me, too long there. It doesn't, excuse me, you don't end up, you know, wanting to be watching something else or doing something else. The action has a lot of these kind of, you know, this, this recent trend in action films where a character just, you know, a, sh a shot lingers while a character just attacks one after the other and yeah you know you see some of that in the trailer as well you know the thing with two torsos and the what's it called you know the cyclops you know some of them have this where yeah the shot lingers and you just see them smashing up a lot of stuff uh, before it cuts to something else the humor there are some genuinely funny bits, definitely, and that's actually some of the better dialogue. This one doesn't have so much of, like, a consistent comic relief character, although it has, it has a couple of characters that are sometimes comic relief. Among them is Hephaestus, played by a wacky Bill Nye, so really a regular Bill Nye, who's... Que you know, quite entertaining while he's on screen. He's he's basically a hermit, and he's like he's gone mad because of being a hermit, and it's enjoyable to watch. You know, this throws in several of the big action movie cliches, and it actually pulls them off quite nicely. Yeah, I think that pretty well covers it. So basically, it's a popcorn flick, and it is quite mindless. But as such, it's worth the price of admission, and it is definitely worth watching in theaters and in 3D. I've reviewed other parts of this series. The links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.